You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. And hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 53 of the Common Descent Podcast. Woohoo! This episode, we are talking about the baculum. Dun, dun, dun. This is exciting because we've never actually done an episode dedicated entirely to a body part. And what a body part. And what a body part. <laughs> Folks, if you are not familiar with the baculum, it is aka as the os penis or the penis bone. Yeah, if that if that wasn't subtle, if that was a little too subtle for you, it is indeed the penis bone. The baculum is a bone found in mammals exclusively, and it's an incredibly unique osteological feature, which is interesting to us as paleontologists. Mm -hmm but also as people who are interested in animal anatomy. The baculum has been described as the most diverse bone ever. Wow. Yep. That's something I, I, I don't know if I would have guessed that. That's really cool. It comes in all sorts of crazy shapes and sizes. It, ha it, it, it Its evolution is really interesting. Its presence in the fossil record. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, because it's rare, and you'll hmm. see why as we start talking about it, but it's been part of some pretty interesting studies. So we're going to talk all about the, this enigmatic, interesting bone in the body. And we will, before the end of this episode, make mention of the baculum's mysterious sister. <laughs> but more on that later. <laughs> this episode suggestion came uh, from an email from Emily B. I have never been so excited to receive an email from one of our listeners listeners who have sent us emails we love all of your emails <laughs> but this email was called it was titled something like thoughts on the baculum and i saw it and i said please please request a baculum episode i would it be was, so happy to get to a baculum episode it was such a good day but just because you got you saw the title of the email pop up and it's just like oh, 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 oh. oh it's gonna be a good day tater <laughs> now for the sake of any listeners who are interested in hearing something, such things, uh, the baculum, of course, is a bone that is associated strongly with genitalia. Yes. Now, the penis, so we're going to be talking about penises. Yeah, a, a uh, bit, a bit. Whole episode. This is this is episode all about penises. Uh, it reminds me of I did a Boy Scouts uh, program once about reptiles and amphibians, and one of the sections was on reproduction. And I was mm -hmm. like, all right, guys, we got to get a couple things out of the way here. Yep. Predominantly the word penis. I'm going to say the word penis a bunch. <laughs> Obviously, penises are used for multiple functions, but the baculum's not. Yeah. Which is to say that this episode is going to be almost exclusively about sex. Yes. This is a sexy episode. Not This is a very sexy episode. Yeah. <laughs> So, well, it's always a sexy episode, but this with paleontology, this one, this one just especially so this one for, for the ladies. No, but if you are or you or anyone you listen with is <laughs> is particularly sensitive to that sort of discussion, just know that's the entire episode. Be, be forewarned, be forewarned. This is this episode's all about sex. Yep. Thanks, Emily. Send all of your, <laughs> your gratitude to Emily. <laughs> Before we get into uh, this adult conversation, we, we will keep it PG. You know, we're, we're going to keep it the normal. Yeah, we're not going to be inappropriate. Uh, <laughs> there may be some jokes, but we're not going to be, you know, we're going to keep it the standard PG family friendly <laughs> discussion. So don't worry about that. Before we get into that. We have one major announcement. As always, this podcast is brought to you in large part by the generous donations we receive on Patreon. And among the goodies that one can get by signing up as a patron, we will, at a certain level, shout your name out in gratitude on the podcast. This episode, we have shoutouts for Thomas, Amanda, and Alex. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate having you on board. We've gotten quite a few patrons 
this in this the first month of 2019 and it's been very exciting it's a great way to start the new year so thank you thank you thank you thank you so much we will endeavor to bring you all sorts of wonderful goodies throughout the year if you are not a patron consider it hop on uh a, a anything you know as low as a one dollar donation every bit helps take a look send it our way we've got some cool stuff planned for moving forward in the year and mm-hmm. your donations will help us accomplish those things and that's it. That's all the announcements. I don't there think there's anything else to say just yet. The single announcements. The one announcement, which means it is time for us to move on to our second segment, everybody's favorite second segment of the episodes of the Common Descent podcast, the news. <gasps> news. Each episode, we like to s- scrawl through the... That's not a, the word I'm looking for. We like to look through, scroll through... <laughs> We like to scroll through. Scroll through the news. <laughs> I'm going to be the old lady that gets punched <laughs> on the I'm train. And I'm going to punch you. <laughs> and bring you some highlights from the world of news in paleontology and evolution. Hey, Will, I believe you've brought some news. I, I in fact, did. I came prepared. My first bit of news is about a particularly famous fossil whale and some fossils that seem to show that it indeed did eat its smaller cousins. I, of course, I'm oh. talking about Bacillosaurus. It's cool whale, episode yeah. 41. So before I get into details about this, the research we're looking at is by Voss et al. in Plus One, and the article we'll be linking to is by Stephanie Pappas in Live Science. So Bacillosaurus, many of you already probably recognize the name, but Bacillosaurus isis is a very famous prehistoric whale that swam around the oceans in the Eocene 38, 35, four million years ago and was big grew 50 to 60 feet long 15 18 meters and had a a very different face than what we think of with today's predatory whales the dolphins and orcas it has a very narrowed skull kind of dolphinish but almost more wolfish like it was yeah it, it was kind of like a mosasaur it does actually yeah and that's why it has the bacillosaurus part of its name is because they thought it was a giant aquatic serpentine reptile of some sort. Yep. Because it didn't look like a whale. The skull is also full of sharp and edged teeth, which suggests it's a predator. For a long time, they had suspected that it likely fed on smaller whale cousins. But this specimen, not new specimen actually, but new research... This specimen has some evidence that shows it indeed did. This Ooh. particular Bacillosaurus was a 50-foot-long specimen found in Egypt in the Valley of Wales, the Wadi al Hitan, and this is a site in Cairo. And it was discovered in 2010, so a little ways back. But research on it has revealed something cool because when this specimen was found, it wasn't alone. In its abdominable region were some bones. So to say, the stomach had bones left over that it had apparently recently eaten before dying. Very cool. Fossilized gut contents are always exciting. These are huge insights into the animal's diet and even potentially how it hunted, because sometimes you can find damage on the bones from how it was gathered. The bones were mainly ribs, skull fragments, and vertebra, and some teeth from a smaller species of prehistoric whale known as Dorodon. Dorodon atrox is the species we're dealing with here. Very similar to Bacillosaurus. They, in fact, used to think they were juvenile Bacillosaurus. (laughs) But it's smaller, only a max of about 16 feet long, 5 meters or so. But this was a juvenile, bones of a juvenile, seemingly in the stomach of this Bacillosaurus. This is the first Bacillosaurus specimen to be found with such stomach contents. So this is opening new doors. And stomach contents from whales are not uncommon. Others have been found with fish and shark remains. So, you know, we have predatory evidence, but now we have direct evidence it was hunting its whale cousins or scavenging. We don't, you know, you can't immediately say it was killing them. Right. But it was feeding on them. The one hint that says it was not scavenging, or at least not likely scavenging, is marks on the skull of Dorodon. The skull has puncture marks that seem to be close matches for the teeth of Bacillosaurus. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Which suggests a killing bite to the skull. Yeah. That's that's hunting behavior. You don't you don't kill 
the corpse you're about to eat, you ki- you kill the baby you just hunted. <laughs> wow. So evidently, Basilosaurus seems to have been eating young Dorodons, and there are other juvenile Dorodon fossils found in this Valley of Wales. So this may have been a previous hunting ground for this animal way back when in the Eocene. Wow, it's where all the babies hung out, so that's where it that's a nursery. picks off one of the little sick ones. <laughs> <laughs> and this nursery may have been a, a popular hunting ground. There's two other cool findings, just little little side ones. They found other remains in the stomach, some teeth from a fish and a shark. The fish tooth uh, is a common fish, Pycnotus. This fish tooth suggests it was also eating fish, but there's also the shark tooth there, which is uh, Cacaracles socolovi, which was a eh, decent-sized shark, 16 feet, you know, 5 meters or so. Huh. Uh, this could have been from a shark from Bacillosaurus eating the shark, but it's more likely the researchers suggest that it was the shark feeding on the corpse of the Bacillosaurus before it fossilized and dropping uh, a tooth. <laughs> lost a tooth. I was going to say, what if it was a shark that bit one of the other animals it ate? Right. <laughs> and then Bacillosaurus came in and grabbed it. It's it, it's it's a, a feeding Russian nesting doll. Fossils. <laughs> <laughs> I like this because the, the 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 image that this brings to my mind is that scene from Jaws where they kill the shark and they cut its belly open and all the stuff spills out. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like if you went back to the Eocene and caught a Vicillosaurus somehow and you cut it open, <laughs> like smaller whales would fall out. Yeah. It's I, I assume that if you were able to, you know, pump the stomach of a Bacillosaurus, it would just be a fascinating collection of the, the local wildlife. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just well, very much like when they do it with alligators and they pump the stomach and it's just like turtle shell, bird bone, snail shell and just like yep. all these random. Th- it's it's really cool to get to see. And I, I love that there are bite marks. That's that's really cool. That's awesome. That is very, very cool. Well, my first bit of news, I'm going to stick in the ocean. We'll stick around in the ocean. This isn't about the end of an animal's life, but the beginning of an animal's life. But although indeed it does, it is an, a marine organism with another animal inside of it. Yay! <laughs> this <laughs> is a pregnant plesiosaur from the Cretaceous, and new insights into how plesiosaurs grew and were born. That's cool. This is research by Robin O'Keefe et al. in Integrative and Comparative Biology, and the article we'll link to is actually an interview by Sarah Gibson on PLOS Blogs. So plesiosaurs, we mentioned them in episode 51 a little bit before we moved on to the better marine reptiles. <laughs> They're the Mesozoic marine reptiles that had the four big powerful flippers that they used to swim with instead of having a long tail. Many of them had very long necks. This research focused on a famous specimen that is actually on display at the Los Angeles County Museum of a mother of a species called Polycotylus latipinus. And we know it's a mother because inside of this skeleton is a baby skeleton. Aww. A little not yet born baby polycotylus. The researchers identified this as a perfect opportunity to examine how plesiosaurs grow from a young age by taking a histology sample. So this, we've mentioned this before. If you take a slice of a bone and you make a little, you know, thin section of it, when bone grows... It doesn't, you know, bone, it doesn't just pop into existence and now you have a solid bone. The patterns of growth are recorded in the bone. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's annual growth, right? They grow differently in winter versus summer, and you can see that. You can see when certain things changed about how they were growing based on external factors. So you can get a really cool sense of how an animal grew if you get these nice thin sections of bone. So they took samples from the mother and the fetus, and they compared it to a growth series of three other closely related plesiosaurs called Dalekorinkops, including two skeletons, one adult and one juvenile, and a humerus that this study identified as being from another fetus. Cool. And here's what they found. Looking at the fetal bones, they found signs of extremely rapid deposition. So the bone shows a signature pattern of bone that is deposited or growing very fast. Which makes sense. So this was a fetus that grew very rapidly. And this is something that 
has been suggested before for plesiosaurs that as juveniles they grew quickly but this study is showing that that fast growth started before birth cool. they were already rocketing through their their growth spurt the young plesiosaur when they looked at its bone also growing fast still uh, even even uh though it was already born but when they looked at its bone histology they found an abrupt change in the way the bone was growing so it was still growing fast but the pattern of growth changed and they interpret that division as a birth line oh it it reflects the change in growth after it was born that's cool and one of the big ways that it changed was that before that the rapid growth was leaving the bone relatively weak structurally so after the birth line it's the focus changes to thickening and strengthening the bone yeah which they interpret as the difference between growing in the womb and growing in the ocean where you are now actively swimming and you have to deal with different stresses that's awesome it's pretty cool and because that birth line was relatively recent in the bone they inferred that this baby they're looking at, that this juvenile, was pretty recently born, mm -hmm. which is significant because it is already almost half the length of the mother. Wow. It is 40% the length of the, the, the mother plesiosaur. So they've interpreted here that plesiosaurs grew fast and grew big. <laughs> on top of this being evidence for obviously live birth out in the ocean which is something we've already known and they're probably only having one baby at a time yeah because you're you're putting a lot of effort into growing a, a rapidly developing a very large baby that's very cool and it's it's neat because it mirrors a lot of other large sea creatures yeah, it yeah. actually Whales it actually mirrors that. I was about to say marine mammals. It marine it mirrors them very closely with yeah. a, a fast growing large baby, one baby that comes out already bigger than a lot of other animals. Yes. Like that's that's cool that that's a a successful technique going back to the Mesozoic. Indeed. And the authors point out that one thing you see with other marine reptile, other marine animals that give birth to large individual babies is they're often associated with parental care, mm -hmm. especially if they're born still kind of weak. Yes. If after they're born, they still have to develop the stronger bone, they suggest that this may have been a species that took care of its babies for a while after they were born. And you can, I, I, I can so picture... If anyone has ever gotten to see a, a documentary of a, a baby whale being born, one of the things that often happens is the mother pushes it up to the surface because it has to get its first breath of air. It has yep. gone from being fed oxygen by the mother to suddenly there being no oxygen underwater, and it can drown very quickly, so she'll push it up. You could so picture a plesiosaur doing something very similar, just rafting it up on her body yes, to the surface so that this little squishy baby can take its first breath. And then if it was... I wonder if they would even help them swim. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's something you see in marine reptiles. I, I don't know. That, that'd that be so interesting, though. That's cool. Indeed. All right. Well, my next bit of news, I'll take in a slightly different direction and talk about a robot. Oh, wait a minute. There yeah. are no robots in the fossil record. Oh, ho, ho, you're right. But this is a robot based on a fossil to figure out how it walked. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> it's so cool. This is research that combined 3D analysis, computer modeling, X-ray analysis, and robotics to figure out the walking gait of a prehistoric ancestor to amniotes. How cool. <laughs> right? This is research by Naya Katura in Nature, and the, we'll be linking to the National Geographic article by Jason Bittle. This is about an organism known as Orobates papstai. This is a member of the family Diodecidae, and this is a group of early tetrapods lived in the late Carboniferous to late Permian, so basically through the Permian. Okay, so like amphibian-y, near-reptile yeah. kind of thing. If the four-leg, long tail look kind of like big-ish salamander-y things if you have to put an image in your head, but they were, you know, not the amphibians we know today. They were 
eh, their own kind of thing, but they were considered to be close cousins to the last common ancestor of reptiles, birds, dinosaurs, and mammals. So the last common ancestors to the amniotes. Cool. Which is, that's an awesome, important group. The specimen we're talking about was found in central Germany in a locality known as the Bromacker locality and dated to the early Permian, so almost 300 million years ago. Extremely well preserved. Like, the whole thing is just laid out perfectly. There's images in the article, so it go see them. They're beautiful. The reason they took a look at this specimen is because this is not the only fossil they were looking at. There is another fossil from the exact same locality, which is important, that was a trackway that has been identified to belong to Orobates. Oh, that's cool. Do you never get that? No. And some of you may be proclaiming, but you guys said ichnofossils can't be identified to the spec. And you are right. Usually you can't place a known species to a trackway. But this is a case where studying the, the, the measurements of the feet and the fact that both these, this trackway and orobates have only been found in this locality has led them to a sign this trackway to orobates. Very cool. Or at least something very, very similar yes. to it. Yeah. That's awesome. It's fun because they actually had to, you know, reassign name-wise because it did have an ichno species name, which was Ichnotherium cepherodactylum. And then they now have it with in the orobates grouping. Cool. Having... Both a skeleton and a trackway now means you can potentially reconstruct how it walked. So they went through a few steps. First step, they 3D scanned the fossil. So they had a complete 3D rendering, a 3D model of Orobate's skeleton. And then they would look at how the joints moved, what was the range of movement, and position it in various postures and have it follow the steps follow the footprints, and see which postures were more efficient, which postures broke bones so it would be impossible, <laughs> which ones were a little extreme so not likely, and we're trying to identify which walking gates, you know, was it laying low, was it standing high, did it have its elbows forward, back, you know, all those kind of things. This was a really cool first step, but it, it does not account for a few things, and they ran 512 simulations wow so they went through a lot but computers can't really account really well for gravity friction or balance so they couldn't narrow down based on the physical limitations of it actually walking under its own weight so they went to the second step and created orobot <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> oh i love it right orobot is a little robot built to the roughly same size as Orobates, the specimen that they were looking at, and now they could apply those postures to this robot and have it actually walk. They built it. They, they built, built it. a prehistoric creature. <laughs> yes. And the way they figured out these gates was by x-raying salamanders and lizards to see yeah. how their bones moved as they walked, and then they tried to mimic some of those postures to see which one fit closest to Orobate's skeleton and the trackway. And they went through more trials. They found some where the robot would lose balance. They even, it has little 3D printed ribs and skull that go on the robot to make it look cool, just because why, <laughs> why, why wouldn't you? They even broke one of those ribs during testing. So like, this was heavy duty testing. Yeah, this is, this is hardcore. This is intense. For anyone who says paleontology is not, you know, high octane exciting. You, <laughs> Wait till you see this. This little weird lizard creature. <laughs> or a bot's broken ri rib. <laughs> <laughs> so what they came to the conclusion of was that Orobates had actually a fairly high gait, that it held itself reasonably off the ground, not dragging its belly like a salamander. That's interesting. More similar to a caiman, you know, to a crocodilian, the high walk. If you watch when they walk, right. their legs go almost underneath the body. Not quite, but close. That it actually probably had a pretty efficient way of walking around which first off is surprising because it had been a thought before this that that kind of gait the quote-unquote more advanced gait didn't mm -hmm. show up until egg layers came around that 
that came along with amniotes. But now it's seeming that it could have come earlier and maybe even be ancestral. So that's interesting. It may also tell us about how these early tetrapods first started walking on land when ancestors first came from the water. This may give us hints as to what the common walking strategy was. Very cool. Which is awesome. Now, my favorite end cap to this is what they did to check their math, because this is awesome. <laughs> to look at whether or not their process really worked and made sense, they did it again, but with modern groups. And so what they did is they took a caiman and a salamander, scanned their skeletons, created 3D models, took images of trackways created by these animals when they actually walk, and then did the test to see if their the model they would end up with would be close to the actual walking pattern of the living animal, and it was. That's awesome. <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> this is like a this is a beautiful mm -hmm. study. Mm -hmm. Like they tested their assumptions. They 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 used modern day models to test the the methodology that they're using for extinct creatures to sort of control for their methods. This has brought in all sorts of different techniques from different disciplines. What an awesome bit of research. The article puts it put it really well. It had a moment where it said that all the techniques you see in the study have been done before. They've all been used, but until now, they have not all been used in one, as they put it, exhaustive study. <laughs> Which That's is so, so cool. Oh, it's I love this one so much. And watching little Orobot walk around, please go to the link, guys. It's fantastic. Yo, oh, it's it's wonderful to watch. <laughs> Well, my last bit of news before we get into our main subject is about dogs. Speaking of cute things, I got one of those. Well, yeah, there's one of there's one next to me right now actually <laughs> because I'm I'm watching a dog. <laughs> and this dog gets to stay stick around when we record. The cat has to go away cuz the cat is noisy. <laughs> if the cat if I left the cat next to us, you'd hear that <laughs> the whole podcast <laughs> this is a study that identifies the earliest dogs in north america Woohoo! which makes them the earliest in the americas period this research is by angela perry et al in the journal american antiquity one of the other authors is our friend chris widga from the gray fossil site Woohoo! the reason that this is on my radar actually is because i'm writing a press release for this through uh, the university. So we will either link that press release if it's out by the time <laughs> the this episode goes up, or there is an article about it uh, by Walt Bonner on Fox News, which isn't as good as my press release is going to be. But yeah, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll of link course something. not. All right, well, yeah, I no, will make it work. <gasps> domestic dogs, as we discussed way back in episode 27, were domesticated first in Eurasia and they were domesticated there by around 16,000 years ago. Now, we know they eventually made it over to the Americas, but we don't really have a good sense of when. The earliest known humans in North America and South America date back to around 14,500 years ago, but the earliest dogs in the Americas date back to around eight to 9,000 years ago. And we don't have a good handle on sort of where and when they came over or what they were doing, Part of that is because dogs are really hard to identify because we domesticated them from wild canids. So they look like wild canids. Dogs are very variable and they tend to hybridize with wild canids anyway. So trying to identify a domesticated dog based on its skeleton can be pretty tough. Yeah, they're very plastic. Yes, they are. But this study found three of them, all three from the Illinois River Valley in central Illinois. Two that they looked at are previously studied dogs from a famous site called the Coster site, and the third one is from a different site called Stillwell 2, which was excavated back in the 60s, but this dog hasn't really been studied very much. These were identified definitively as dogs based on their morphology, which is very dog-like, as opposed to some who can be very confusing, and the fact that all three of them were found individually buried. Oh. In an intentional burial. Oh. So that's cool. people bury these dogs. That's cool and also sad. Yeah, well, I, well, it, it what's fascinating is that it suggests that by whatever time this was, people had already developed a strong attachment mm -hmm. to these dogs. 
Mm -hmm. Like they were significant enough to these early American people that they buried them, which is really cool. That's awesome. Like burying your fellow humans is one thing. Like you, you buried your dog. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. (laughs) They performed a few studies. Uh, The predominant one, the, the really important one was that they carbon dated them. Uh, the coster dogs had been dated in a the, the the sediment near them had been dated, but this is the first time that the dogs themselves have been dated. All three they took rib fragments and dated the dogs from both sites and got dates ranging between ten thousand one hundred and ninety and nine thousand three hundred and sixty years ago, which suggests that these dogs were around by around ten thousand years ago which not only makes them the oldest, well-dated, you know, securely dated American dogs, also the oldest known individual dog burials anywhere. That's awesome. Which is pretty dang cool. They also did stable isotope analysis, which we've talked about before. You pick up your isotope ratios from the environment, often by the food you eat and the water you drink, and they found that the dog's Isotope signature suggests that their food was coming from a forested environment and lots of fish, freshwater fish, which match what you get from humans around this time. Because at this time, the central Illinois area wasn't prairie like you see today. It was still very forested. And finally, they looked at the morphology, the skeletons of the dogs. They were medium sized. In fact, the paper actually has this wonderful figure of a human silhouette with the dog silhouettes standing next to it, and they're about knee high. Yeah. And they had the range of pathology or bone sort of injuries, wear and tear that you typically see on dogs that have an active outdoor lifestyle. So cool. these weren't like sitting around in the in the hut. Like these were actively running around and, and probably living outside doing stuff alongside the humans. And there was some significant variation between them, which is really interesting, which which raises questions about sort of where was the variation coming from? Was it based on their lifestyle? Were they already hybridizing with wild canids? There is some evidence of that, mm-hmm. that, that at least some of these may have had a little coyote in them. <laughs> so it paints this wonderfully cool, detailed picture of these early, early dogs in the Americas. That's fascinating. That's such a such a uh, complete. I mean, not complete, complete, but it's a very good picture of yeah, a lot of detail, a lot of detail in there. How what they were eating, the fact that they are buried, what kind of you know activity they were participating in. It's really cool, and it's very interesting to see how that shapes the picture of you know humans during that time here in North America. So that's that's another piece of the puzzle and i like it there are a few questions remaining so for example these are the oldest known american dogs but they're still more than four thousand years later than the earliest known humans which raises the question so the dogs came from eurasia right there's there's not strong evidence that dogs were domesticated in both places so they came over with humans but does this suggest that they weren't They didn't come over with the earliest human migration. Maybe they came over later. And the question of what they were doing. Uh, The paper makes the really interesting point that for humans at this time, North America would have been a brand new environment. Mm -hmm. So the dogs may have been really important for hunting and for protection and for navigating this unknown new ecosystem that they were entering. Yeah, just just having that, that little bit of aid, that sidekick. As you went into a, a, the new world. Indeed, indeed. So cool stuff. More to learn from ancient dogs. Awesome. Prehistoric puppers. And hey, you know what dogs have? A baculum. The dogs have a baculum. They sure do. Not the one sitting next to me. She does not. <laughs> but half of dogs have a baculum. So why don't we use that ham-handed segue to move on into our main topic discussion after this short break. <laughs> All right, it's time to talk about penises. Penises. Let's start. <laughs> <laughs> Creepy. Let's start <laughs> by 
asking the question of what is a baculum anyway. A baculum, or bacula, the os penis, the os priapi. It's got a lot of names, uh, so that it, a lot of names to avoid having to say penis bone. Right, right, <laughs> just to try to sound scientific and professional. <laughs> the baculum is a bone that grows within the soft tissue of the penis. It is something that is found all across mammals, not all mammals, but many mammals, and exclusively mammals. It is, as I mentioned before, why, renowned as, quote, the most diverse of all bones. Which is a significant title. It's pretty cool. This is a bone that comes in all sorts of crazy different shapes and sizes. There's lots in, in the modern uh, living animals. There's a bunch known from the fossil record. And it's rather mysterious. It's hard to study sometimes. There's a lot of questions about it. Uh, as you can imagine, it's not a very big bone a lot of the time, so it can yeah, be difficult big enough to get a hold of. <laughs> it's not the it's not the size that matters. <laughs> well, it, you know, it's a pretty small bone. It's not the now, it's not the size; it's the shape. <laughs> <laughs> but before we talk about the bone itself, let's take a step back and talk for just a moment about penises. <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> if you insist. In this episode of the Common Descent Podcast, two guys. Talk about penises for an hour. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. But in all seriousness, the biology of penises, because penises, you know, we say bacula are super diverse. Well, that's this is something that they have as a corollary to the fact that they grow in an organ that is just ridiculous in its variation. There are so, there are so many weird penises in the animal kingdom. It's crazy. So what's a penis? A penis is an intromittent male organ, which is to say, right, male, found in the males. Intromittent means you stick it in other stuff. Yeah. It's meant to to be it's enter the, into another thing. It's the plug, not the outlet. It is the key, <laughs> not the keyhole. He Penises the key function in the, <laughs> in the internal delivery of sperm. So, right, at some point, evolution went... You know, I've had enough of this just shooting sperm out into the ocean thing and hoping. Mm -hmm. What if we go straight to the source? Yep. Just put directly into the body of the female. No more of this. Cut out the middleman. Cut out the, the middleman. So as you can imagine, penises are extremely helpful. This is a really important, novel, uh, useful organ for intercourse. Mm -hmm. it, and it brings about interesting behaviors because now you know... Or at least pretty sure that those young are yours. Yes, or at least you would think. Oh, ho, ho. yeah, it gets dicey sometimes. As you can also imagine, uh, an organ that is that useful and that interesting has shown up many, many times. Yeah. Penises are polyphyletic. They do not have a single ancestry. Penises have evolved separately many times. So who has penises? Well, here's a quick list. <laughs> Obviously mammals. The who's who of having penises. The who's who of penises. Mammals, widespread across mammals, in fact, I don't know of mammals that don't have penises. They probably exist because evolution is weird. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm sure there's one, but yeah, yeah. yeah, I can't think of any. There are a number of birds that have penises. Mm -hmm. uh, rat heights do. Fa very famously, ducks have penises. <laughs> yep. <laughs> they have these weird corkscrew these penises. cthulhu <laughs> lovecraftian <laughs> things not great no nah, they're horrifying reptiles have evolved penises on a number of occasions uh turtles have penises turtles some turtles have these long very maneuverable penises as uh, our kemp's redley showed off his and i was in front of the <laughs> halftime i'm like and you can see he's going to the bathroom and then i noticed that what it wasn't coming off i went nope no he's not Nope. <laughs> it's longer than I expected. <laughs> speaking of anim of reptiles Will likes, crocs have penises. They do. And speaking of reptiles that are better than the reptiles Will likes, <laughs> just, squamates. Hey, just because you have two doesn't mean it's better. Two, two penises. That's twice as much reptile as Will's animals. Uh, when, when you're the size <laughs> of a crocs, though, <laughs> like when your animals are the same size, as the Crocs penis. Let's just put it there, all right? <laughs> <laughs> and shape sometimes, too. 
lizards and snakes are one of the the defining features of lizards and snakes is the hemi penis. They have hilarious. two penises, one each attached to one testicle. <laughs> It's just like, well, we have two of these. <laughs> why, why don't we utilize them? There are a number of fish. No, I don't know of any, like, true penises in fish, but fish often have claspers or other organs that serve a very similar function. A very con- convergent structure. Yep. Insects are astoundingly diverse in their penises. Uh, lots of insects and other, you know, there are millipedes that have it. There are, are spiders or spider-like creatures that have penises. Our friend Josh used to say he considered that if inse- if the insects he was looking at had different genitals, he counted them as different species because of how diverse those structures nope. can be. <laughs> and that's very com- It is very common for modern insects to be classified by characters on their genitalia. Yep. Some mollusks have penises. Barnacles have famously large and maneuverable penises. Mm -hmm. There are some cephalopods that have penises. And very fascinatingly, there are even cases across the animal kingdom of female penises. Yep. Of what are sometimes called pseudopenises, where the female genitalia has taken on a penis-like shape for various reasons. You see this in insects. There are certain primates, like the spider monkeys, that do this. And most famously, hyenas. Yeah, yeah. That, th- their females can put other animals' males to shame many a time. Yeah, they're, it's impressive. And they give birth through them. Which, ha! Ah. And when they mate, the male has to intromit into the female pseudopy. It's super weird. Hyenas are so weird. It's just, it's just like, I... I I appreciate what you're going for, but it seems like it's just causing a lot of problems. <laughs> Penises are astonishingly diverse. We'll talk about why here in a bit. But before that, I wanted to ask, hey, Will, do you have any favorites? What's your favorite? What's your favorite examples of, of crazy animal penises? I do indeed. We've mentioned a couple. I even as horrifying as they are, the whole duck reproductive organ war is fascinating because because the males have these corkscrew penis that when protruded comes out all at once really fast yeah they like (laughs) turn it inside out and the reason for that it's like a party favor (laughs) the female duck's vagina is corkscrew in the opposite direction and has dead ends to try to avoid the males forcibly mating with them yep (laughs) The longest duck penises what? that I've read about are 17 inches. What? <laughs> it, just... gets, it gets pretty ridiculous. I do like cephalopods because they, they form one of the tips of their arms into a, a penis-like structure. Some of them transmit sperm with it. Other them just give the female that arm while mm-hmm. mating. Just go, here you go. <laughs> and here's my penis. <laughs> you take care of that now because <laughs> uh, I'm going to go die. <laughs> There is one species that I've read about, the Argonaut octopus, that detaches its penis, and its penis swims away to go yes. find its female. Oh, right. I have. Yeah, that's <laughs> insane. <laughs> just, just like, all right, your mission, if you choose to accept it. <laughs> it's, well, it's, it's the penis going, you know what? I think this sperm, these, these sperms have a pretty good idea. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try that out. <laughs> just, I'm going to give them a head start. But I have to say, my favorite, just because if you're if you're gonna talk about ridiculous one, whales, yeah, whales with their, with their sometimes ten foot long prehensile penises. Yeah, yeah they're maneuverable. They, they can move around <laughs> because once again, nature's not always pleasant. As the females try to avoid unwanted attention, they'll roll on their backs, and so the males have these long periscope penises that they can reach across her body to try to (laughs) still get to her upside down which and just watching those flail around on the surface of the water it's i can only imagine that that led to many a sea monster story (laughs) in the history of sailing a few others that i always uh, marsupials often have forked penises yeah echidnas have four-headed penises (laughs) I learned recently that a lot of ungulates grow a sheath over the penis called a pizzle. (laughs) (laughs) 
But my favorites that I want to mention, and the barnacles are ridiculous. They're super long. They grow a new one every year because, you know, uh, obviously bed bugs. I'm pretty sure we've mentioned bed bugs before. I feel like we might have, but I, I don't know for sure if we have. Uh, bed bugs have needle shaped penises. Yeah. Because the female does not have a receiving entrance, so they have to make one. Yeah. And on a similar note, there are some flatworms that they're hermaphroditic, which means that all the flatworms have both male and female yeah. parts. They're both both. But you'll have two flatworms get together and fight to be the male yes. with their dagger penises. And the first one to penetrate the other one and for deposit sperm gets to be get, gets to go do it again to, to another worm. Yep. And now like, the other one has to go make eggs. Jeez. And then uh, I also I just recently learned this. Will, do you remember last episode where you introduced us to the concept of stridulation? Yes. Would you like to remind everyone what stridulation is? Stridulation is when usually insects take two of their body parts and rub them together like you rubbing your finger against a comb to make noise. The lesser water boatman, which is an aquatic insect, makes its distinctive mating call <laughs> by stridulating its penis against its abdomen. <laughs> <laughs> and there are tons of others. This is just a quick list. It's incredible. <laughs> Will's, Will's still losing it. I just, I immediately got just uh, the picture of him just strumming away. Just, yep. Just, just. <laughs> <twanging>. <laughs> now, that list wasn't just for fun and so that Will and I could geek out over animal penises. <laughs> All of this ridiculous diversity raises the very serious question of why? Why is there so much diversity in penises? What what's wrong with just a penis? <laughs> what are you all doing? Don't you have time for other things? <laughs> it doesn't even look like one no more. <laughs> and this brings us to uh very briefly, uh, I want to go over the concept of sexual selection. It's it's a actually a fascinating subject that I feel is not talked about often enough. It has been stated that the morphology of penises is argued to be subject to more rapid divergent evolution than any other form in the animal kingdom. And this comes down to sexual selection. So you are all likely familiar with natural selection, mm -hmm. right? If you have traits that allow you to find more food, avoid predators, survive, you know, anything that allows you to survive, you're likely going to have babies and you're going to pass on those traits that you that that allowed you to get to that point sexual selection focuses on selective pressures specifically against mating yes which is arguably the most important thing you have to do yep it all the rest of those things about surviving don't matter if you don't make babies you could be the the, the most fit to your environment animal that has ever existed if you can't mate you're the last one yep and sexual selection is fascinating because priorities for sexual selection are different for the different sexes. Mm -hmm. Because females typically produce few eggs and thus few offspring, and it takes a lot of effort to, to make a baby, and it's high risk. Yes. Males produce tons of gametes that are small and easy to produce, so a male can have tons and tons of babies with relatively little effort, mm -hmm. especially compared to females. This leads to something called Bateman's Principle, which states that female reproduction is limited by access to resources for nourishing and developing offspring, whereas male reproduction is limited by access to females. Yep. And this means that sexual selection involves a lot of intraspecies competition. Mm-hmm. Sexual selection can take the form of intrasexual selection, which is to say members of the same sex complete competing. Mm -hmm. So this is where you get, you know, deer and, and moose and bison fighting each other for, for territory. This is why they have those big horns. Yeah, males uh, uh, competing for position and for dominance. Yep, for mating rights. Yeah. That there are multiple males vying for the same females, and now you have to fight 
Uh, some animals create harems, right? Elephant seals are, are the example I always yes, think of. Where they absolutely. have these big beach harems. The beach master. But you can also get intersexual selection, which is selection that that, that is happening in disagreement between the sexes. <laughs> This would be like or male showing off and stuff. Courtship, you know, your singing, your display, uh, females being, usually the females being choosy mm -hmm. about which mates you want. Now, oftentimes we think of sexual selection as something that happens before mating. Yes. Right? Courtship and fighting and all that. But that's not the only place that this selection happens. This can happen at the genital level where you have, you know, something like, how long copulation lasts mm -hmm. can be a, a factor. Uh, some if you're if the interaction between genitalia can induce ovulation, yeah, that's an important trait. There's also some really disturbing stuff, like uh, some animals have genitals that will scoop the sperm of the previous mate out. Yep, <laughs> so they can put theirs in. Others have developed what are called copulatory plugs which block more mating from happening. Yeah. And then females, uh, in many cases, have developed uh, uh, methods of choosing whose sperm they accept. Which still, that's one of the most fascinating features to me. Yeah, where it's already inserted, right? You've already gotten it, but they can push it off to the side or they can discard the sperm of the mate that they don't want. Mm -hmm. They can be selective even after copulation has happened. Yeah. So you can imagine that these traits being so important, like if you have a trait that noticeably increase, even not that significantly increases your chances of just having a baby, that's under very intense selective pressure. Because once again, that that is the down to the wire. You know, everything yes. else is to get to that point. Everything else is as far as things are concerned in the big scheme of things, icing on the cake, this is what makes the difference. If you can't get past the sexual selection, all, all the rest just gets lost to history. And so yep. a lot of pressure here. So a slightly negative trait is going to disappear real quick, and a slightly positive trait is liable to spread very rapidly. Mm -hmm. So you get these ridiculous features... My favorite example of, of a feature, before we get to actual bacula, is genital spines. Yeah, yeah. Because genital spines do all of the things. So a lot of animals have spikes on the penis. Uh, your house cats have this. Yep. Snakes have it. This, this is actually very, very common. A lot of insects have it. And what's cool is that spines have been implicated in removing sperm that's already in there. Mm-hmm facilitating the transfer of sperm, sticking into the female so that your copulation lasts longer, yep. which is helpful not only for lasting longer, but preventing other males from getting in there. Yeah, if, if you just don't move, yep. it's hard to have much competition. Stimulating females. Cats, for example, don't ovulate until copulation occurs. Displacing copulatory plugs, <laughs> in some cases, or, and hey, here's a terrible thought, dealing damage that yeah. prevents the female from mating again. Yeah, once again, nature's n mean sometimes, like really, really mean. <laughs> yes, but all of these functions, once again, if any of those start showing up, that's going to be furthered very quickly. So that goes a long way to explaining why genitals are so crazy diverse. Which brings us to the baculum, to the star of today's show. <laughs> the baculum is a structure, is a bone found in the glands, which is the tip of the penis, that extra sensitive tissue at the tip of the penis. Baculum is usually dorsal to the urethra. It is extra skeletal which is to say it is not attached to the rest of the skeleton. This is why it's not in the song. <laughs> right? the, the, the thigh bone's connected to the hip bone. Well, the reason, I can't think of any other reason, why the penis bone's not in the song is because it's not attached to anything else. It's bonus. Like like osteoderms, like other bones. Did you say it's bonus? <laughs> it's bonus. <laughs> <laughs> 
So it is it is a floating bone off the rest of the skeleton. It has uh, three different parts that are derived of different kinds of bone, which is kind of cool in its in its structure. I didn't know that. And it comes in all different shapes and sizes across many different groups of mammals. So as I mentioned, not all mammals have a penis bone. Not Half mammals. of our audience may be wondering uh, right now about themselves, or if our Facebook and Twitter demographics are to be believed, two thirds of our audience may be wondering uh, right now. <laughs> no, gentlemen, you do not nope. have a penis bone. No, nope. humans are among the mammals that don't have it, but it is found widely across primates, also rodents and bats and carnivorans. So dogs, cats, bears, weasels, and so on. You'll also find it in shrews and moles and hedgehogs and selenodons and gymners and tenrex and colugos and golden moles. For a long time, it was thought that it was completely absent in lagomorphs, which is the group that includes rabbits and hares. But in 2014, a study reported a, the presence of bacula in the American pica. Oh. The first known lagomorph to have a baculum. Huh. Which suggests there might be more. That's interesting. Yeah, that was five years ago that that, that was discovered. We're still learning about it. Who still knows? learning. <laughs> On the contrary, there are no bacula known in ungulates, your hoofed mammals, horses, goats, giraffes, and so on. Cetaceans do not have them. Uh, that's your whales and dolphins. Elephants, hyenas, sirenians, so your manatees and dugongs, monotremes and marsupials do not have them. And humans, of course, do not have a baculum. This reminds me of the the news article that that you shared. I don't remember how many episodes back. That was about external genitalia in mammals. Like yes, where and just that the dis distribution was very erratic. Oh right, about elephants. Yes, exactly. It's about how elephants didn't have it and why they didn't have it. Yeah, and and this this it reminded me of this because the distribution is all over the place. Like you know who yeah. does and doesn't have it is is not as consistent as you might expect you know there might be some parallels that you can find but it's it's not uh you know carnivore herbivore and nope it's it's and you know uh you you get you definitely see some trends in that all the prehensile penises are on the non-bacula side <laughs> <laughs> they're all very very maneuverable because because elephants got that too uh yep. the Papers. trunk wasn't enough uh, <laughs> um, but it's it's it just seems so randomly you know, arbitrarily distributed among animals and that's that's peculiar it, it, and we'll talk a little bit about the evolution of the baculum or at least what we understand of it mm -hmm. like the penises that house them bacula are extremely variable they the smallest bacula are under a millimeter long that, wow and the largest ones are nearly a meter Yep. And this, uh, the walrus has the, walrus. The, 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 the distinction of having the largest baculum. And in fact, we, it, ask any paleontologist and they have seen that one cast <laughs> of the walrus baculum. Yep. That's broken in the middle and rehealed. Yep. The pathological bacu <laughs> baculum. <laughs> which means that it broke <laughs> during the life of the walrus. Which I always used to call, I always used to say, well, that was a bad day for Mr. Walrus. Which is still true, but apparently that is very common. Which, I mean, is not yeah. completely surprising, but also, huh. You know, still not great. Not great. More on that later. More on why. You know that that walrus never stopped telling that story. <laughs> 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 oh, you know, you know, I've he, been through some stuff, too. He yes. never made up with that, that lady walrus. <laughs> it's just, no, that we, just the end of we that hit it off, but that, at, at that first night, you know, that just kind of, it just kind of soured things. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> We couldn't make it work. <laughs> well, uh, bacula come in all different shapes and sizes. A lot of them, the more boring ones, are just straight. Some of them are particularly curvy. You get these cool curvy shapes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the giant panda has a weird baculum. It's under the urethra for yeah. reasons no one understands. Because the panda has to be weird. Uh, a lot of bacula are variable in how the bone is structured or how much of it is cartilage versus the fully ossified bone. And then there are rodents. My favorite example, well, these will be in pictures in the blog post. Ground squirrels have bacula that are spoon shaped and toothed. Yeah. So they look like the spoon that I have for scooping noodles. <laughs> yeah. It's got these toothy projections along the spoon shaped 
like like tip. a rake like a ra- yeah it's like a rake it <laughs> looks like a rake it's a rake and rice rats and voles have bacula that are trident shaped <laughs> they are three pronged yep it's ridiculous now the majesty of animal bacula has not gone unnoticed by humans uh bacula are very common commonly found as tools and novelty items <laughs> For humans yep because because we've been humans the whole time <laughs> <laughs> for some reason at least half of us are obsessed with these things <laughs> northern cultures so arctic cultures have long been known to use uh what are called oosix or usix which are usually walrus bacula that have been carved or modified into tools or clubs or knife handles or jewelry like it's a handy big dense piece of bone to have oh around. yeah yeah no it's it's good building material i i watch the youtube series man at arms where they they craft video game fantasy movie weapons <laughs> and they have used walrus bacula before to carve handles that are supposed to be bony or tooths from like lord of the rings that's awesome yep <laughs> If you search for Usix on the internet, you will also find se- sellers of what are called Mountain Man's Toothpicks. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Which are usually raccoon or coyote, you know, s- at smaller animal bacula. <laughs> <laughs> for getting, the, getting that, that, that <laughs> to, walrus to, meat out to, of here. To get the raccoon out. <laughs> the to get the meat out. Exactly. Yeah. Well, this is handy. <laughs> the Ripley's Museum claims to have the largest baculum in the world. It is, if if the claim is to be believed, uh, 10,000 years old, found in Russia, and reportedly four and a half feet long. That's wow. not quite a meter and a half. Wow. From a an extinct walrus. Whew. That's a big bone. That that's a that's a big penis. That's a big penis bone. <gasps> now, of course, uh, we've got all this variability. All this this diversity in in baculum shapes and sizes and presences, you'd think we'd have a good understanding of what it's for. Obviously. And you'd be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> there is actually a lot of hypotheses about this, and there's a lot, there's some support for some of them, but we we ju- we do not have a really solid idea of what bacula are used for. Obviously, they're important in mating. Mm -hmm. And indeed, there have been studies that have found that the size of the baculum correlates in some species with reproductive success, with number of offspring. In primates, it's been noted that polygamous species, species that mate with multiple uh, uh, partners, tend to have longer bacula. Seasonal breeders tend to have longer bacula. And these things suggest that the baculum is important, at least in those species, in male-to-male competition. Yeah. That if you are a polygamous species, if you're mating with multiple females, you're vying for that attention, then the size of the baculum is probably helping you, you know, do the deed better than the other males are doing. Interesting. And there are a handful of commonly cited hypotheses about what the baculum is actually doing. One of the most common ones is the suggestion that it simply supports the penis during intromission. Uh, and intromission is not the, the break in the middle of a play. Intromission <laughs> is when the penis is in a vagina doing what penises do. Ah. Intromission. Longer bacula often correlate with longer intromission. Uh, one study reportedly found that the dividing line was three minutes. Huh. That species that copulate for longer than three minutes, at least in primates and carnivores, which is, I believe, what they studied, tend to have, you know, that that, that duration predicts a larger or smaller baculum. Huh. And this goes back to what I mentioned before, that longer copulation is a competitive advantage Mm -hmm. because in the nicer way to think about it, it means that, you know, you can ensure a successful transfer of sperm. Yes. And in the less nice way to think about it, you capitalize on that female for as long as you have them. Yep. I, it's, it, it is a much more effective technique than dibs. Yeah, well, and it's you don't have to fight another male off. Yep. You're like, hey, I still, sorry, still work, still here. Socks still on the door. <laughs> Occupied. <laughs> Occupied, yeah. And it's, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, I want. I do want to take a moment to 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 step aside here and and <laughs> like it is very tempting always to make direct correlations between sexual behavior yep. in other species and with humans. Yes. And I remember being a young man and learning about sexual selection and saying, I figured out why men and women do all the things that men and women do. Obviously, it's all because of these biological imperatives. I've cracked the code. I've cracked the code. Uh, dear young people of the audience, don't do that. No. Nah. <laughs> That's no. not how it works. We live in a complex society and we are complex organisms. Uh, try try not to boil down humanity to these simple uh, behaviors. Yeah, it's it's a a little bit more complex. <laughs> Another thing that has been suggested is that the baculum helps to aid sperm flow and transfer. Right, not only is it supporting the penis during sperm transfer, but there's some evidence that it reduces urethral constriction. Hmm. That it's basically keeping the passage open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that the sperm can pass through. Uh, speaking of keeping the passage open, another suggestion has been delightfully titled the vaginal friction hypothesis, which suggests that the baculum provides support to act as a wedge to get up in there. Yeah, yeah. Which which sounds silly, but, you know, we were talking before about how you have sort of this antagonistic relationship sometimes between females and males trying to control the mating process. Mm-hmm. Well, one easy way to do that is just to close it off. Yep. Like if a female is intentionally makes it difficult for the vagina to be penetrated, then yeah, having a a shoehorn penis yep. to a, get in there is a battering ram. A, oh yeah, yeah. No, no, I know. <laughs> well, I, think, I, I know. think of it like the um, like what's the the duck shaped thing? That oh, the, the... it's it's some kind of forceps. But yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> yeah I know forceps. what you're talking about. <laughs> Well, and so that's a thought. Uh, and aside on that note, because we've mentioned a couple of times about females trying to avoid mating, uh, yep. which sometimes, yeah, it, it is kind of as horrific as it sounds. Like there are some animals out there who it, it is not dolphins uh, to burst your bubble. Not a beautiful sight to watch dolphins during mating seasons. I've seen it. Male dolphins are bad people. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's bad. Yeah. But there's also a sexual driving force in sexual selection for females to actively make it difficult because they don't want the male who has who who needs an easy time to mate. They want the male who can overcome challenges, who can who can show <laughs> that they can get it done no matter yeah. what, because that's potentially a sign of strength. So there are animals who it's that's kind of the point is I'm not going to make it easy, you know, because yep. I, I want my young to have good, healthy DNA from someone who can get the job done no matter what. So it it's complicated, once again. Yeah, and when you go back to the idea of sexual selection, you know, you imagine that one male, right, that, that one population that evolves a trait that makes them a little bit better at reproduction. Well, if that spreads, then any male can mate with any female because they have this incredible advantage. And once that's spread everywhere, there's no longer a selective differential there mm -hmm. so it's it behooves the females to to evolve countermeasures yep to to say all right well if any male can mate with any female then there's no filter yeah for for good or bad genes so this sort of uh arms race yep. appears which is where you get corkscrew shaped vaginas for corkscrew penises and it's where you get flatworms trying to stab each other with their 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 penises well it's it's uh i don't know why this is the my, my brain makes up weird metaphors but it's it's the concept of like people at auditions and a person getting the shoe in because they can act and sing and so everyone learns how to sing and then the director goes all right but can you dance yes yeah and absolutely and now there's a new pressure because it's not impressive if you can all sing it was only impressive because we didn't have an actor <laughs> who could sing it's that it's yeah sorry it your baculum is so last generation yeah well oh, you're still using that version nah. you still have spines i have the baculum <laughs> s the back the baculum <laughs> s5 <laughs> <laughs> the last ma major suggestion for the purpose of the baculum is to stimulate the female reproductive tract mm -hmm. uh, i mentioned before that cats 
uh, the spines of a cat are meant to stimulate the female into ovulation. In some rodents, it's been observed that the length of the baculum correlates with long vaginas in the female. Oh, like the hummingbirds and the, the flowers. Yep, which suggests some sort of stimulation use. Uh, <laughs> nope. <laughs> Whoop. Nope. <laughs> many bacula in many different species, rodents and primates, the bone actually protrudes from the end of the penis. Really? So that, for example, the teeth of those ground squirrel, the rake-shaped thing, would actually stick out of the penis. And it's been suggested specifically for those that the teeth of the ground squirrel bacula interdigitate, which is a word that means if you, if you, you know, entwine your fingers between each like other. A, like a zipper. Like a zipper with the folds of the vagina. They're holding hands. So it actually is like a lock and a key in a keyhole thing. That's fascinating. That also answers the question because when I was looking at those spaghetti scoops, yeah. I did have a moment of like, how tightly does the skin form to that to make that shape useful? Oh, yeah, that makes much more sense. It doesn't. It just yeah. pops out the end. Sticks right out. And one paper that I read said that some bacula have, quote, articulating elements that may function dynamically during copulation. <laughs> That's exactly, <laughs> yes. It makes me think of, like, Iron Man's armor. It's like, <laughs> like, it's moving and doing stuff, and that's so weird. What? One other study I want to point out. Uh, there was a study by Miller et al. in 2000 that was comparing, or at least uh, part of the, the, the article was comparing phocids, which are earless seals, and otariids, which are eared seals. And apparently, phocids tend to have large bacula, and otariids tend to have small bacula. And some of the noticeable differences between them, phocids have multiple matings within a season, whereas otariids mate once a year. So once again, we're seeing larger bacula are in the species that is doing that are doing multiple matings that have more intense competition for inserting sperm and also displacing sperm from other males. Ah. And also they point out that the earless seals with the larger sperm, uh, larger bacula, tend to mate in the water. And not only can water damage sperm, but in the water you're moving in three dimensions, which means that there is a selective advantage, perhaps, for a stronger, larger baculum. A stabilizer. A stabilizer, and also because it's going to break. So having it be... Uh, once again, this is apparently very common in carnivorans, where there's competition for mating... Is It's not like the other males are like, oh, he got in there. I guess we'll all, we'll all walk away. <laughs> it's more like dogs fighting over food. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to push you out of the way. And unfortunately. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't do it. Don't do don't, it, man. <laughs> Just tensing everything. So walruses, which are otobenids, they're a different group, also mate uh, oftentimes aquatically and have these large, robust bacula whereas elephant seals who are huge and have a ton of mating competition uh at least you know they're making their harems and they're fighting oh yeah violent fighting mate terrestrially and have extremely small bacula huh so there seem to be these correlates with where you're mating how you're mating what kind of competition you have uh the diversity of function of form and uh, the fact that certain shapes have shown up multiple times over baculum evolution probably suggests that there are multiple functions and multiple overlapping functions so it's it just this crazy diversity of form and function in how these incredible bones are doing their duty well and it, it's fascinating and this is not you know wholly unique you know there's other structures that have had similar shapes for different purposes but the fact that having a long or sturdy, you know, more robust baculum is not one cause. There's multiple reasons you might want that. Some that might be completely separate from one another. And yeah. that's really interesting, which means you can get a lot of, you know, potential convergence, you know, convergent baculum evolution of both these animals have big, long baculum. But this is what this because this one's in the water and this because this one's promiscuous you know and that's yeah that's really interesting indeed super cool bone so as you can imagine 
both very difficult to study and very interesting to study if you can find them in the fossil record. Yeah. So coming up next, we're going to talk about the fossil record and evolution of the baculum. Count bacula. <laughs> <laughs> So as you can imagine, fossil bacula are not particularly common. Uh, not only do they tend to be fairly small, which you don't know do well. Nope. So they're small. They're thin. Uh, the, you know th that's not the kind of thing that's going to do very well. And they're extra skeletal. They're yeah. not articulated with the rest of the skeleton. So like as things fall apart, there's nothing to hold it, like ligaments and stuff. Yep. Just load away. So as you're decomposing, you're just, just going to be washed away or something. Bye-bye, baculum. You're never going to find it articulated, because it doesn't articulate to anything. No. So when you find a fossil skeleton, it can be very difficult to tell if the baculum is absent in that species or just missing. For example, there was a study, a 2015 study, that looked at Darwinius, which is a very famous early primate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they noted that it didn't have a baculum, so it was interpreted as a female. Uh -huh. But they also made the point that, well, it, it could also just be missing, because they're just rare to find in the first place. Uh, I actually asked Sean if we have ever found any bacula at the Gray Fossil Site. Ooh. And the answer is no. Hmm. To this day, even though we had dogs and cats and bears and all sorts of little mustelids buku carnivorans lots of rodents and the uh, honestly the answer is that it's probably not being caught in our screens oh yeah just except for when we're using the fine screens because they're so small we need to go hunting for baculum yeah we do oh i'm on it the, the minute we got baculum at the gray site i'm gonna post it all over the place <laughs> the one time it's okay to do that the one, yeah, I'm going to send, I'll, I'll send pics. <laughs> but I found two studies that I wanted to make mention of that were interesting examples of fossil baculum studies. The first was Abella et al. 2013, which reported fossil bacula, multiple, of an extinct bear named Indarctos arctoides from the late Miocene of Spain. Cool. They were able to make a few different interpretations on this which were really cool first just its morphology and distinctiveness from other bears that you could if you only found the baculum distinguish it from other bears well uh, like insects like insects once again a benefit of these being so diverse and under so much selective pressure they very rapidly can evolve a unique shape i would i would love to see a animal textbook that had family tree but instead of like footprints you know like when they use that as animal books it's just yep. all the different bacula bacula here's black bear brown bear <laughs> and they the, the the study pointed out that in other species baculum can be used to identify species or genus that's awesome this particular bear also reportedly had the largest known bear baculum oh it was over 23 centimeters or over nine inches long. Nice. Compared to modern day polar bears, which are over 16 centimeters and six and a half inches long. Interesting. So that's pretty cool. The other thing they were able to say, and this is awesome, uh, they were able to distinguish adult from juvenile. Whoa, cool. Because the different sections of the baculum, uh, some of them fuse together shortly after birth. But the final fusion doesn't happen until puberty. Oh, interesting. So they were able to distinguish. They found five bacula and they were able to say four of these are adults and one of them is not yet an adult. You're, you're reaching that age where you may notice some interesting things happening to your baculum. <laughs> so you can tell ontogeny from bacula. That's real. Oh, I, I like that bone fusion. Like we've seen that in other skeletons. Crocodilians are famous for that where... They fuse from the tail yep. to the head so you can get a rough idea of its age. It's cool that that happens with baculum. Yeah. This is also, there was a study that showed that you can do this with modern day raccoons. Cool. That if you have a population of raccoons, you can collect their bacula and tell, based on the ossification, the fusion, 
which ones were adults. That's awesome. And then the last thing they were able to do is interpret behavior. Because as we've discussed, a lot of things tend to correlate with long bacula. So they suggest that this bear probably uh, had prolonged intromission. Mm -hmm. Right? Long copulation period. Possibly a multi-male mating system where there was uh, yeah. male competition. And they also mentioned that possibly larger territories, oh. such that longer intromission, a longer copulatory period, would have been beneficial because you were only rarely encountering each other. Yeah, well, it's like what happens with modern-day panda bears where they, they rarely cross over, and so ha they have to make the best of the situation. Yep. Who knows when you're going to see a lady bear or a man bear again. Exactly. Now, funny, funnily enough, pandas have extremely reduced bacula. Which, once again, because they're weird. Because, yeah, pandas. I don't know. So here's an example of a study that was able to determine identifying characteristics, age brackets, and potential behavioral inferences from the bacula of these fossil bears, which is super cool. Uh, wait, it's once again, because it's, it's such a commonly missing piece. When you do find it, it opens all these doors that previously just aren't available. Yeah, and that you just didn't. You just couldn't have asked. Yeah, that's awesome. The other study I want to mention is a, a, a paper by Hearthstone Rose et al. 2015, and it is entitled The Bacula of Rancho La Brea. <laughs> the Rancho La Brea tar pits, of course, super famous for their collections of very, very late Ice Age animals. According to this paper, they have recovered the bacula of several coyotes. Uh, there's also... Badger, weasel, and fox bacula. As of the writing of that study, no bear or cat bacula have been found. Interesting. Which is interesting, though they have them. But the the crowning star of this study are the dire wolves. <laughs> I believe we've mentioned this before, and if the listeners, if you've never been to the La Brea tar pits, they have a wall of dire wolf skulls. Because at La Brea, they can boast that they have found approximately 400 dire wolves preserved well enough to get the skull which is more dire wolves than it's fair for anyone to have yes it is well guess what else they have about 400 of <laughs> dire wolf bacula that's, which is incredible that's awesome because you're finding entire skeletons all together in the in the tar which yeah, yeah. is beautiful you're for preservation sealed in by this gooey death trap penis and all there it is so they compared the Canis dyrus, that is the dire wolf. So the dire wolf, by the way, is a late, is a, into the late Pleistocene species of wolf. And they were big and beefy wolves compared to our wolves today. They were not like Game of Thrones monsters, but they, you know, they was an extinct species of wolf. Yeah, just, just robust. Compared to Canis lupus, the gray wolf, the dire wolf bacula were 44% longer and in terms of volume, almost five times larger. Wow. These were big baculumed wolves. That's the dire part. That's the <laughs> These situations in the situation was pretty rough. <laughs> this suggests once again probably intense male competition, probably multi male mating system. Also they point out that and I, I I have did not read much into this. Apparently longer bacula are correlated to colder environments. Huh. Huh, indeed. The other thing that they noted that was very interesting is that of the approximately 400 os penises that they studied, only eight showed injury. Oh, that is very interesting. Which is extremely low because, as we mentioned before, carnivorans especially tend to fight. They tend to fight over mates, and this leads to very often broken bacula. But the dire wolves did not have that, and the authors suggested that perhaps part of the reason they were so large and robust was to withstand that aggression. Oh. That maybe they they evolved these monster bacula specifically so that they wouldn't be breaking their bacula all the time. Interesting. Indeed. That's yeah, that's really that's really cool. So rare in the fossil record, but when you get them, you can make some really intriguing comparisons and in some really interesting interpretations of what prehistoric ancient animals were doing with their penises any any time you can widen that behavioral window 
into the the fossil record is one is always one of my favorites like what was it doing yeah is really cool and what what i mean there's lots of things i could tell you about but what better better bone in the body than the baculum to give you a whole bunch of insights into a big part of that animal's life absolutely like mating's a huge activity for a lot of animals there's you know ones that do it all year round there's ones where it's a single season and it's the season like yes it's where (laughs) everything goes this is when we swarm yep it's everything is just as intense as it can be so this is a really cool piece of that that puzzle that and we know so little about fossil animal mating behavior Mm -hmm. which is really cool yeah there's some animals that we still are basically just throwing ideas at the wall i mean like dinosaurs yep we don't know how dinosaurs made it like there and there are some very interesting ideas but eh, we don't we don't know and getting a a look into that and just complete completes that that visualization of how this animal was just living like another animal yeah i like to think of it that evidence you know from most parts of the skeleton a lot of fossil evidence can paint you a picture of an ancient animal Mm -hmm. but behavioral inferences can construct a video yes exactly like now i can picture dire wolves fighting over (laughs) over their mates and brief documentary series like you know sessions and and scenes of you can you can potentially see what a mating looked like because i mean you have videos of it with wolves and it's it is very different than what you might expect and now you have a slight image here yes so fossil bacula are rare but there there's plenty of examples of them uh, you know you start looking through the literature for fossil bacula and they're they're out there uh they're not very common but when we do find them they tend to make a bit of a splash <laughs> but the other way we can study baculum evolution is to look at modern distribution and extrapolate back mm-hmm. v- fascinatingly Two studies came out in the year 2016 that attempted to investigate how bacula evolved and came to completely different answers. Great. So we don't we don't have a whole lot of it. But <laughs> I'll tell you what the studies found. So one of them was Brindle and Opie, 2016. They did a big old phylogeny. They collected data from something like 5,000 living mammal species to reconstruct a family tree. Uh, and this is pretty common, right? We do this with... We'll we'll select genes and do this. We'll select skeletal features or soft tissue features and try to reconstruct the evolutionary history of that feature. They found that the baculum is not ancestral for mammals. That it's not something that was present in the earliest, earliest mammals, but something that evolved later. Their study suggested that it had evolved by 95 million years ago. Okay. But that it would have evolved in placentals and not monotremes and marsupials. It evolved after the split. Yeah. Which, of course, fits with the fact that those animals don't have bacula, and that it has been lost multiple times. And I was wondering, I was wondering which it would, you know, show, because it not being ancestral makes sense, because not, it's, it's not just the rule among mammals. There's tons of mammals that don't have it. Huge groups. Right. You know, ungulates is a giant group. Yeah. And so that makes sense. But the fact that it's they're thinking it's on the placental side and then was lost in groups is not what I would have expected. That's yeah. Huh. More specifically, they also found that it would have been ancestral for primates and carnivorans, that the last common ancestor of primates and carnivorans, dogs, cats, bears and so on, had it. And then it would have been lost multiple times in the descendants of those. Okay. And they they were focusing on primates and carnivorans because those are where some of the best baculum information is known. Yeah. So that's what they found. (laughs) But another study that came out the same year, Schultz et al. 2016, disagreed with that. Uh, And they don't, as far as I could tell, they don't uh, refer to each other because they probably finished their research about the same time. But the Schultz et al. study points out that a lot of studies trying to reconstruct baculum evolution assume that all mammalian bacula are homologous. That is to say that they're evolutionarily derived from the same place, which they argue might not actually be true. (laughs) So they did a different phylogenetic approach that tried to avoid that assumption. And according to their results, and they looked at about a thousand uh, species, I believe, they found evidence 
that the baculum has evolved independently in mammals at least nine times. Wow. Nine times. But also that it has been lost at least ten times. <laughs> So both studies find evidence that the baculum has been repeatedly lost. The second study finds evidence that it has been repeatedly evolved. So not only is it variable in its shape, it's variable in just where it has shown up and disappeared. Like, it's ju there's just so much evolutionary activity going on with this bone. Well, and, and the point that, you know, because it's a very similar structure, you know, it makes sense to think that it's, you know, developmentally that as, as the organism grows in the womb and develops this bone, that it would be, sim you know, the same, where, like, our finger bones and basically among mammals come from very similar sources. Yep. But maybe not. And if it's not, that suggests that it's different evolutionary path. You know, this might be a, a lot of animals going, it really helps to have a bone in your penis when you're trying to do stuff. And then they all developed it in different ways. Which, first off, Okay, that's unusual, <laughs> but also would would be a huge amount of you know convergence among multiple groups. Yeah, it would and honestly, if weird evolutionary stuff's going to happen anywhere, yeah, it's going to be in the penis. Yeah, I mean, one it it's it is a surprisingly plastic. I used that term earlier for any of you that know. Plastic is a way we describe things that are very easily molded, you know, evolutionarily that don't change shape slowly or change features slowly. They can do it very quickly. Right. Very diver very variable. Yeah. Yeah. It it's very easy for it to develop many morphologies. For such a plastic feature, it would make sense that you're kind of that it can come to similar solutions independently in different groups. Uh but I mean, for some of them, there are, are very, very similar. Yeah, and I don't know, it's just, huh. Huh, indeed. Another major question in the evolution of the baculum, uh, you know, speaking of how it's been lost many times, obviously there's an interesting question to be had of why is it lost, but most significantly, why don't we have it? Yeah. I say we as a whole, but also we, like me and Will. Yeah. I didn't get one in the evolutionary handing out stuff. I, I call cheats. Many people have, have wondered this, right? Because primates, ba bacula are super common across primates. But in apes, the, uh, they, sometimes they're absent in apes. But in a lot of apes, they're, they're, they're just small. Mm -hmm. Like chimps and bonobos, they have bacula. They're just very small bacula. So why not humans? The answer, and it's pretty straightforward, the answer that's been suggested, and there, was, there have been some studies on this, that because humans, right, at some point in our evolution switched over to a lower competition mating habit, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> Less, like, because chimps are mating with everybody. Yeah, competitive and aggressive. Chimps, all the females mate with all the males, yeah. Humans are more monogamous. Humans are less competitive. And, and this is amusing because jokes, <laughs> <laughs> humans tend to have a short intromission. Yeah. We are, as the, uh, I think it was Opie, uh, one of the, the authors I mentioned before, made the point in an article I read that as much as we like to to talk, we fall below that three-minute cutoff. That on average, the human copulatory period is under two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, you know, that's it. it no, I don't have a comment. Uh, no, no, sorry. No, no, I, no saving know, that one. So instead, humans, you know, we, we support our genitals differently, right? Yeah. We have the hydraulic system yep. Yep. instead of an actual bone system there. Much like an anemone. Much like an anemone. But, and this is fascinating, there are cases known of human penis ossification. So this is there this is are, the this is the horror part? <laughs> there are yeah, this is this is the, the, the body horror section of our <laughs> There are cases known of humans developing bone in the penis, which some have suggested in the past could be an atavism, mm -hmm. which is to say a feature that is within our genes but doesn't activate usually. It's like, like when they discovered, teeth. yeah, it's like when they discovered a uh, deleted content in a game's code. Where it's like there was yes. going to be a bonus character, <laughs> but they didn't make him, but they left it in the code because it was too much trouble to delete it. Yep. And it makes that glitch. 
But more recently, uh, medical professionals have suggested that it's probably not that. It's probably just an abnormality. Yeah, just just a disease. It's often found in older men. Most of the cases reported are older men. And uh, often also associated with uh, pathology, with injury. Oh. And that's known in a lot of cases where you'll damage soft tissue. And if you, you know, bad roll of the dice, you might get ossification bone forming in places where it's not supposed to form <laughs> your body's like heal that up it's like all right all right yeah here's some calcium and <laughs> like, no 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 we we need collagen and we need we need muscle to ah i got extra of this that's yeah, fine it. calcium now use you, it hey, somewhere now you got a little bit of bone in your lungs awesome <laughs> one i wanted to read this quote just because just because this is from yilmaz at all 2013 which over, you know, overview of human penis ossification Ahem. In 1933, Vermouten described a 19-year-old male in whom a bony mass had developed in the gland's penis. The patient also had a gunshot wound at that site three months previously. Presumably, ossification had taken place in fibrosis resulting from this injury. End quote. The good news is your <laughs> bullet wound has healed. <laughs> the bad news... I read that. I, re I read that. I was like... Who did that guy piss off? Jeez, I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> shoot you with my bone bullet. <laughs> or was he one of those guys in the movies that they hand him a gun and he just sticks it down the front of his pants? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. What what cool story did he tell to the doctor? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, there were twelve well, of was, them. I'm surprised I, was, I only got hit once. I was fighting over a mate. <laughs> <laughs> and my, your body has developed a vacuum in response immediately <laughs> Whew. that talk about <laughs> that walrus thought it had a bad day yeah right <laughs> Whew. so vacuum evolution more than a little bit mysterious uh humans don't have it and we probably never will that's probably a, an, an abnormality and when it'd be interesting with how little we know how like what is it a is it a fluke we don't have it did it, is it that it was small in apes and then at some point it just kind of went and just just what wasn't there yeah. and, and we just law there was no reason to keep it and yeah. it just well and you because you have to imagine right we talked about selective pressure mm -hmm. that the notion that if you have a feature that is beneficial or or not then the passive process of natural selection is going to select but that can just as easily select against something. Yep. So it's not surprising that this is something that keeps appearing and disappearing. Mm -hmm. It's notable that we're the only ones. It's yet another thing that we humans have that's just so makes us so much different than so other much primates. Like the pandas. So much like the pan. That's not promising. <laughs> no, no, it's not. I don't want to be like the pandas. <laughs> I don't want. Now that is. All that I have to say about the baculum, Believe some evolution, not. some function, for now. I can say more, <laughs> but, you know, it's getting obscene at this point. Fossil record, uh, evolution, all that fascinating stuff. But I would be remiss if I did not take some time to discuss the baculum's mysterious sister, the bobellum, <laughs> also known as the os clitoridis, the clitoris bone. Because of, because of course there is. Because <laughs> of course. Now, uh, for those of you who are not aware, the, the tissue that makes up the penis is the same as the tissue that makes up female genitalia. Yeah. Right? It develops from the same stuff. It just takes different forms. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the bone. In males, it, in, in male mammals that have it, that bone develops into a baculum, but females can have the thing as well. Their version is the osclitoridus, the bobellum. Now, the bobellum is extremely poorly understood, extremely poorly studied, and this is all tied into my favorite fact about the bobellum, which is that because it is not well understood, because it is typically very small, because we don't know a lot about it, one of the biggest challenges in trying to understand this bone is that in both living and fossil species, Scientists often have a really hard time finding it. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know what the function of this thing is. We don't know if it's usable for identification. 
I looked around uh, through the literature for uh, fossil examples, and I have not found any. <laughs> oh, wow. To my not, and I, it's, it's possible I've missed them, but at least as far as I know, there are no fossil bobellum examples. Yeah, well, I mean, which, yeah, that'd be real hard to identify. They're usually a few millimeters long. We don't know what we're looking for in a lot of cases. I was talking about this topic with Laura, our friend Laura, at the museum. Mm -hmm. And she was telling me that she was in the room one time with one of the other grad students who was dissecting a cat. And he was specifically looking for the bobellum of this cat and never found it. Wow. It's just so hard to find. But there are a few things we can say about it. There was a study that came out just last year, Low Stevens et al. 2018, that did a survey of who has the bobellum, you know, where is it shown up, what's it like, basically, what's the diversity of, of bobella. They found that most species that have a baculum also have a bobellum. Not all. There are a few species that where the males have a baculum and the females do not have a bobellum. All right. But most of the time, you, you get them both. But that bobella are even more variable than bacula. What? That sometimes they're very small, sometimes they're absent, sometimes they're cartilaginous. Sometimes you have a species that sometimes has it. What? Where some individuals have it and some individuals don't. And hey, maybe that's why Patrick couldn't find that cat bobellum. Who knows? They come in all sorts of diverse shapes, similar to bacula. In squirrels, apparently, they twist and taper and flare, and in the tropical ground squirrels, the bobellum is shaped like a flared spurred spoon. Oh. Much like the baculum is. Interesting. So you get all these shapes and variable s things. Um, in some species, the uh, they vary ontogenetically. That some, uh, they appear with age or disappear with age. Okay. The fossa is a fascinating case. So we talked about the fossa in episode 40. It is a small carnivore that lives on Madagascar. In fossa, during a short period of time, around the time they reach maturity, fossa develop a large spiny clitoris, which is supported by a bobellum. Okay. But then this goes away as they get older. Huh. It might be a form of male mimicry. Yeah. That during that time of life, you want it to look from a distance like you have a big honking penis so that the males don't bother you. Yeah, 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 exactly. So there is some potential function for some species, Bobella. The fact that some of them have these crazy shapes means that maybe they're using it for something, but we do not know. Based on their distribution, evolutionarily, there's been a, it's just been it's been lost a ton of times. So they're ju we just don't know what they're doing. Wow! It has been suggested uh, by some that this variability, all you know, all this 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 weird you know crazy diversity, might be a result of relaxed selection. Yeah. That is, instead of like the baculum being under that intense, you know the. The slight change might change how the selective pressure acts on it. The bobellum might not be under selective pressure, which is what allows it to just keep, you know, coming and going and differing morphologically and ontogenetically, mm -hmm. which may imply that it's not really serving much of a function. Yeah, like wisdom teeth. They can they can just kind of disappear and eh, doesn't really make a difference. Yeah, which you would you could classify them either as vestigial in that case mm -hmm. or and I, I haven't seen this written anywhere, but it makes me wonder if they could be like male nipples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it's you're not using it, but it's part of your species development mm -hmm. because the other half of your species is using it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just kind of pick it up along the way. But not everyone agrees with this. Some some have pointed out that nah, there's there's enough diversity here and there are enough weird shapes that the 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 bobellum is probably doing something mm -hmm. and we just don't understand it man genitals are weird they're so weird wow and that's all that i have to say about the osclitoridus i'm sure there's more i'm sure people have people have looked into it i there's just so little that is actually known it's who knows well the the thing that's not only are these hard to find bones you know 
sometimes extremely hard to identify. And not only are they are they seeming to do a huge variety of things, but they're so inconsistent. Like yeah. it just it seems so hard to find any really strong trend. Like there's a there's a few like you mentioned that popped up, you know, like mating in the water or stronger competition and things like but like it just seems so all over the place. It's yeah, I'm sure eventually we will find that one connecting factor that brings everything into line. Yeah. But it's just, it's so, it just seems so arbitrary with some of the things. Like, why yeah. you and not you? Why big and not, you know, small? I, who knows? And it's, it's, it's real tough when you don't even know what to look for. Yeah. Like, you could spend your whole life searching through a particular species but they don't have one. Mm -hmm. And then who, it, it's, yeah, they, they, they can be very difficult to study, um, which doesn't stop people. There are a number of researchers who have devoted their lives to studying uh, genitalia and specifically uh, the mammalian penis bone, which is pretty cool. So I'm the genitals guy. Uh, well, actually, most of them are women. That's cool. From what I've seen. Uh, I, I have no comment about that. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah, please, please keep studying it because I, yeah. I want to know these answers. <laughs> <laughs> Find those answers. Tell us all about penises. Well, dear listeners, surely by now you've had enough <laughs> of, of this conversation. We we retroactively apologize. <laughs> Thank I, this, you. Know, it's, it's, been, it's such a cool topic. I was so excited to do this episode. So I we've mentioned this before that every now and then a topic will come up and one of us will get excited enough to call dibs on it. Yes. I immediately as soon as I saw Emily's email, I was like, oh, I actually, if I remember correctly, I read her email, threw my hands into the air and shouted to no one. Yes, dibs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember that because you saw the email first and you messaged me. And you said, we just got an awesome topic request, and I called dips. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. So, huge thanks to Emily for this awesome suggestion. What a, what a fun discussion this has been. Thanks again to all of you for listening. Thanks again to our patrons for your just immense support. Keep it coming. We love it. You're awesome. As always, if you want to make your own ridiculous suggestion, or send us feedback on our ridiculous conversations, reach out to us on the social media or through email. Check out the blog for extra information about what we've discussed, for links and pictures. Uh, all of our news links will be on there. There's also more information on how to get in touch with us on the blog. As is always the case, we release new episodes every fortnight. Keep your eyes out for episode 54, which should be, if everything goes according to plan, a very special episode. Yes, indeed. And I was going to say something else, and then I <laughs> forgot it. I'll, and Oh, so after we finish this, this recording, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and record a session of After Chat. Yes, indeed. Which is something that we do for our patrons. Uh, usually just us chatting some more, so if you like listening to us talk about stuff, we'll put After Chat up on the, the Patreon after this. Also, patrons, keep your eyes out because we also are putting together a blooper reel yes. from uh, 2018. So keep your ears out for that. And I think that's it. I think that that is enough said. About... It's enough of that locker room talk. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Get back to a good, wholesome episodes. Yes, a family friendly episode. <laughs> I think that talking about reproductive organs is as family friendly as it gets. I mean, how else are you going to have a family? Where do you think families come from? Without a good sturdy baculum. Listeners, thank you so much. We sign off for now and we'll see you again in the next episode. Indeed. Toodles. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.